I don't think at any other school I would have had the breadth and depth of opportunity to do music and to do journalism. The most powerful proof points of a liberal arts education are the passionate pursuits and outcomes of our students. Hi, and welcome to Conversations Beneath the Cupola, a Gettysburg College podcast where we highlight the great work happening on campus and beyond. I'm Bob Giuliano, president of Gettysburg College and your host. In this episode, we are joined by Ben Ponce, a political science and public policy double major, music minor, and a very involved member of the class of 2020. Ben serves as a drum major of the marching band, as an Eisenhower Institute Fielding Fellow, and the editor-in-chief of the Gettysburgian, to name a few of his many pursuits. Ben, thank you for joining me today. In your role as the editor of the Gettysburgian, it is normally you who is interviewing me. I thought it was only fair. What's the old saying? Turn around is fair play. So I thought it was only fair to put you on the other side of the microphone and have the opportunity to get to know you a little bit better, but more importantly, to help you help our alumni and other interested friends of the college get a better sense of what it means to be a student at Gettysburg College. So thank you for joining me today. Happy to be here. Although, as you mentioned, this is a bit of an unfamiliar territory. I usually ask the questions that don't have any clear answers and then, you know, watch other people squirm. So this will be this will be different and exciting. It will increase your level of empathy. <laughs> so I'm looking forward to that. So you've written a variety of articles during your time at the Gettysburgian. Uh-huh. Do you have one in particular that stands out for you as your particular favorite? Oh, wow. Well, so I, in preparation for this, thinking that something on this topic might come up, I, I looked it up and have apparently over the past seven semesters or so, written a total of 188 articles, which struck me as a lot. And I didn't reread all of them. Um, I'm glad to hear that. Yeah. Uh, I mean, I would say that a couple of kind of areas stand out. You know, last spring, I wrote a 6,600 word diatribe about the the just whole beginning to end story of, of the business major and, and all of that and how it, it, it fizzled a little bit last spring and certainly has since been since been approved. But in kind of looking at that, there was a lot of kind of history baked into the, to that story and looking back at efforts in the college back to the 1980s around, you know, some of the same questions of, of what constitutes a liberal arts education. And so that was certainly one story that was interesting and fascinating that I, as we are recording this in the beginning of finals week, uh, or heading into finals week, I wrote that last spring instead of getting ready for finals week. I did okay on my finals, week, so it was okay. Um, but in any case, that would be one. And then the other one that would, I guess, stand out would be a couple of, this was probably uh, the spring of 2017, I guess, or maybe 2018. They all run together. But as the college worked on developing a, a statement of, of institutional philosophy on freedom of expression, the Gettysburgian editorially endorsed that statement. And I wrote most of the editorial. And um, in in fact, there was a particular line from it that I I probably will not quote completely accurately, but it had something to do with our freedom ringing loudest when we don't silence others or something. And your predecessor, President Riggs, told me, Ben, you know, I think that should be on a wall somewhere. Um, And and, now you've stenciled it on your wall. And and my mother, um, (laughs) I must have told my mother this, and she got it printed out and framed, and it is now indeed on my wall. Congratulations (laughs) to your mother, who I'm soon, soon will listen to this podcast. Well done. Why those articles? What makes those seem to you particularly important or have a connection to you that strikes you as worthy of separating them from the other 188 or whatever number it is you said you'd written? I think that ideally what, you know, there's the old phrase that journalism is the first draft of history. And I think that ideally what the Gettysburgian does, in addition to informing the, the campus community today on what's going on today, is that I have many friends that are history majors, and, and they tell me that in their historical methods classes in particular, when they're writing papers about the history of the college, it's all, you know, almost not all, but one of the primary sources they're using is is archived editions of the Gettysburgian. And so thinking about what kind of the big issues on campus today are, and then framing them in a way that that brings the context of of what questions those stories touch on broader themes about the liberal arts and and 
you know, what the college's role in society in general is. And I think that both those stories and both those kind of topics in general illuminate some of those themes. I don't want to focus our attention solely on the Gettysburgian, as important as it is, Mm -hmm. because you do a lot more than that as a student on campus. Give us a sense of some of the other activities that you engage in. Yeah. So in addition to the Gettysburgian, which I would say is probably the primary extracurricular activity, I have a host of campus jobs, including working at the research desk of the library and working as a faculty member's research assistant over in the political science department. I serve as a teaching assistant or PLA for peer learning associate for um, a first year seminar in the political science department. And so those things take up a good chunk of time. But in addition, I serve kind of in a club sort of sense. I'm the news director of the campus radio station over at WZBT, which ties into a lot of the work I do at the Gettysburgian. But separate from all of that, I've been involved in some Eisenhower Institute programs, um, including the former Inside the Middle East program. Um, That was my sophomore year, and that culminated with a trip to Israel and the West Bank that was certainly an interesting and and formative experience in a number of ways. And uh, this year, I'm a a fielding fellow in the Fielding Center um, for Presidential Leadership Study, which is entailed which has entailed some work at presidential libraries thus far. We were at the we, we went to the JFK Library in September and January. We'll be going to the Reagan and Nixon libraries on a whirlwind round robin tour of California the week before before uh, the spring semester starts. I anticipate it being warmer. I'm hopeful that it will be warmer there than it will be here in January, but I guess we'll find out. And then the other project relating to the Fielding Center is that the Fielding Fellows are working on a State Department research grant that is expected exploring economic development in Montenegro. And in March, we will be heading to Montenegro, which is a country that I think perhaps at the outset of the project, many of us would not have been able to place on a map necessarily, but that we have certainly learned a great deal about in the past several months and will continue as we're looking at that. So that's all of that. And then aside from that, of course, there's the various things that I do in the conservatory. Including as the drum major of the band, as I understand it. You know, it is so striking. So I've been on this campus now for five months or so. And while your experience is, I think, on the extreme of student engagement, I will say it is one of the things that I have so admired here, that our students have the opportunity. And I think this is a byproduct of the fact that we are the size that we are. That is, we are not so small, we are not so big. Our students have the opportunity to engage in things that would be hard to do at a smaller school, Mm -hmm. but are possible because we're not so large that these opportunities are foreclosed because of just the sheer number of students seeking to compete. And I've also experienced, Ben, that, and I'm curious if this is your experience, that all of these extracurricular and co-curricular activities ends up amplifying the students' learning, and learning not just about the world, but also about themselves, where their talents lie, where their passions lie. Has that been true for you? Yeah, absolutely. I think there are a couple of discrete examples that, that maybe I can share to just shed a little bit of light on that. Certainly with the Gettysburgian, there have been a whole host of skills um, that have proved useful in internship experiences subsequently, as far as some nuts and bolts things about running websites and starting and editing podcasts and, and those sorts of things. But also, you know, there are probably not a whole lot of other opportunities where someone with, you know, the level of experience that I have is running an organization that, you know, has 50 or 60 students involved and, you know, involves everything from, you know, top level charting kind of what the strategic directions of that organization are going to be all the way down to after this interview, picking up the pizza for our holiday event that will be happening this evening. So like, you know, there's just a whole host of responsibilities associated with that. As you took on these responsibilities, has this been a do-it-yourself, learn-it-on-your-own experience, or has the college helped guide you in any respect? Do you have advisors? How does that work? I mean, I think the answer to your question there is yes. It has been both of those things. Uh, Certainly, every organization of which I have been part has been well advised by faculty members and administrators alike, and certainly their counsel has been of great importance to the success, particularly of the Gettysburgian and and of of the marching band, which I imagine we'll get to. But in general, I would say that it's not 
advising as far as here's what you should do. It's advising in the sense of, well, you know, I'm going to sit here and let you talk through this and work to the answer that you're going to get to and then tell you that I think that's the right thing to do or maybe suggest that there's a different path you could take. I can imagine the how to do it may be different than the what to do, rightly the what to do being a judgment by the student. So how do you make it all work? That is, you've taken a rigorous academic curriculum throughout your three and a half years here, and you have all these other activities. How do you balance it all? Carefully. I would say that in kind of practical terms, I'm a pretty copious and perhaps neurotic organizer and planner and uh, accounter of, of my time. But I think that in general, it's about setting you know, kind of taking time when I'm not in the thick of all of it to identify goals. I identified, I think, 20 or 30 goals for the year of 2019, kind of spread across different areas from academics to extracurricular activities to, you know, personal items. And, and you know, every every week I check in on how those are going. You know, it's funny, this kind of arose out of a, you know, everyone sets these New Year's resolutions. And I'm like, well, that's how many people actually follow through on them. But, you know, it was kind of one year when instead of doing that, I figured, well, I'll, you know, start outlining some more specific things. And and then every week I do check in on them. And I would say that of the 20, I think there were a total of 32 this year. I would say that maybe 20 of them are, you know, in the bag. Uh, A few of them are no progress made, and the rest are somewhere in between. Well, that sounds to me admirable (laughs) progress, uh, all things considered. You mentioned the Eisenhower Institute, which is one of our distinctive programs, but you also talked about the band and your music minor in the conservatory. So one of the other distinctive aspects of Gettysburg College is the fact that we have the Sunderman Conservatory. Mm -hmm. My experience is that having a conservatory of that quality deeply embedded the way it is here within a liberal arts education is distinct and actually ends up creating opportunities for students that may not be true at other conservatories. You have no comparative reference, but have you found that the that the conservatory work, the band work, and the academic work complement one another? Yes. I think that one thing that is just true in terms of the numbers is that to have all of the various music ensembles that we have at this college takes more people than this a college of this size can enroll as music majors who are going to pursue this professionally. And so that has created a wealth of opportunity for students such as myself who are not planning to be professional musicians of any type, but who have in, you know enjoyed music in high school or, or wherever and come into this environment and find opportunities from the very beginning. The conservatory has been a a place where I have found the opportunity to find some release from other things. You know, when, when all else fails, the, the euphonium or, or now this semester, oddly enough, the bass trombone is just kind of sitting there and it's something I can do that takes my mind off of other things and do at a, a level that, you know, is at, at minimum is able to support the people who are doing this professionally. So, Why Gettysburg? You had choices, I know, including of schools that um, some people would regard as higher ranked than ours. Why'd you end up here? That's a question that I have been asked several times and always feel like I have a less than satisfying answer to, at least into why I decided at the beginning to go. I visited Gettysburg the spring of my junior year of high school and truth be told, do not have any recollection of that visit other than that it happened and that I think we stopped the sheets on the way home. So it was on my list at in, in high school, and I visited other colleges and kind of as my senior year rolled around, had reasons to cross off other schools. And I ended up in April, and, and as you, know, you may know, decision day is May 1st, in April, still kind of wondering about Gettysburg. And, and I ended up going on the political science department website and cold- emailing, I guess the corollary of cold calling, cold emailing to political science professors who, you know, were American government folks. And that's what I thought I might be interested in studying. And one of them, um, Dr. Shirley Ann Warshaw, wrote me back in like a day with a pretty detailed case 
for why Gettysburg. And I read this email. I'm like, oh, that's interesting. And I wrote her back and asked a few questions. And she said, and, you know, you'll you'll enjoy my first year seminar, which, as I mentioned earlier, I now am the TA for. And I said, OK. And, and you know, it was just kind of that in combination with knowing that Gettysburg had a marching band that kind of got me over the hump to decide that Gettysburg was going to be where I was going to try and, and, and make this happen. And I think that certainly I've appreciated that I made that decision at the time, even though I don't know that I had necessarily fully kind of thought through what all of the, you know, all of the next four years would look like at the time. So I take it from this, you're not looking back and saying, boy, I screwed up in making that decision. No, I would say that certainly I don't think at any other college that I considered, and as you mentioned, I considered some that, you know, I, you know these rankings take them for whatever they're worth would be considered higher. Uh, but I don't think at any other school, I would have had the breadth and depth of opportunity to do, you know, to do music and to do journalism, which are both things that I doubt I'll be necessarily going into professionally, although who knows. But to do them at the depth here as kind of things on the side while studying political science seriously, while double majoring and, and, and doing all the things in EI and, you know, having in the course of once the same spring I went to Israel and uh, with, with an EI program, I two months before was in Europe with the Wind Symphony. And like, it was just a... It is, it is very <laughs> much a classic Gettysburg story. And the other thing that has so impressed me in my time here is the, not only just the sense of community, but how passionately people feel about the college, uh, not just our alums. I was just talking to someone the other day who was observing that a great sign of a healthy and dynamic campus, a place where students are happy, is just walk around and see the number of students who are wearing their school apparel. And if you walk around the campus, you see just about everybody. You are currently wearing a Gettysburgian sweatshirt. It's, it, it's really quite something. So you're going to graduate, we hope, in a semester I, and I a group so of too. finals. <laughs> um, do you feel, maybe you can't answer this, but do you feel like you are prepared? I know you don't know exactly, I'm not going to ask you what you're going to do, so you don't know exactly what's next for you, but do you feel like Gettysburg has prepared you well? I mean, I certainly hope so, and I do think that, I, I do think so. I mean, it's difficult to imagine, you know, I, I read a, an article a while back that said that I don't remember what the number was, but I think it was a double digit number of the number of expected jobs that people graduating from college will hold in their lifetime. And it's difficult to imagine that any college experience would have been the hard skills preparation for all of those many jobs. But I think that it's difficult to imagine that any of those jobs, and, and not even just jobs, anything that I would do after Gettysburg College will be something that doesn't require working with other people who sometimes, for in the case of the newspaper, there's nothing that I can really I don't have any money to pay them. I don't have any real incentives to offer other than the intrinsic value of what I believe we're doing and what I think that I've been able to convince members of my team that we're doing. And it's difficult to imagine that those sorts of skills of, of building teams and of communicating effectively in writing and in verbal discourse, although I feel like this answer is a little bit rambling, so maybe the verbal discourse needs to be honed a little bit, that those skills won't be useful in any post-Gettysburg thing. You've just given, I think, a classic defense of the liberal arts education in the first instance in two ways, Ben. One is that, as I'm fond of saying, if you can tell me what the future of work looks like, then I'm happy to prepare you for it. But I think the changes in technology, the changes in society, the changes in the world will mean there's a dynamism in the nature of work and the nature of life, I think, mm -hmm. that's coming ahead. And so the important thing of a liberal arts education is to give students like you the skills to be able to adapt to be able to respond to changing circumstances and the varied experiences you have had in the classroom and outside of the classroom, I hope have prepared you for doing that. So I think that's an important part of what we're seeking to do. So a couple of more questions for me. One is, if you could change one thing about your Gettysburg experience, what would it be? There are some classes I've taken during the time that I've been here in which I have probably missed the opportunity to engage with the person who's teaching that class who is an expert in their field to the extent that I wish I would have given that I am unlikely to be at a place where I can wander into the world's leading expert on Abraham Lincoln's office and he'll drop everything and chat with me about Abraham Lincoln. 
And it's difficult to say what I should have taken out in order to do that, given all of the things that I have done. But I do think that if there is something I would do more, it would be to spend more time chatting with faculty in their offices, not specifically about a particular upcoming exam or something. And I think that's exactly right. I mean, I can't speak to your experience, but the hallmark of this place is the intimate relationship between faculty and students, not just in the classroom, and the commitment of the faculty to help students. My last question to you, Ben, and that is, what would the editor-in-chief, Ben Ponce, ask the student, Ben Ponce, that I have not asked you? Then you're going to have to answer that question, just to be clear. So you better give yourself a softball. Oh, boy. Uh, what's your favorite servo cook? No, I promise. Um, <laughs> I truthfully don't usually have enough time to eat in servo. One thing I haven't done is studied abroad, and that's something that certainly a great number of students here do. And so I guess the question that the editor might ask is, why did someone who did so many other things not not study abroad? And you know, I think the answer to that is that there was a lot going on on campus that I felt like I would be leaving to do that. And I think that one thing that has certainly become clear to me is that Gettysburg's campus has this kind of ineffable magnetic attraction to people that it certainly has for me that leaving it even for a semester didn't seem like it was going to be something that outweighed what might be achieved on campus in the community. And I think that, you know, certainly a focus of mine academically has been communities and local institutions. And the institutions on this campus that I was part of and others that I get to cover as part of the Gettysburgian, for example, were of such importance and vitality that I felt like I wanted to be a part of them for all eight semesters that I had the chance to do so. And that's a perfectly mature and thoughtful answer. 60 some odd percent of our students study abroad, but that means that 40 some odd percent or 30 some odd percent do not. And what you have done with your time here, I think I can confidently say has permitted you to experience this in a very full way. So you use the phrase tied down. I'm not sure Gettysburg tied you down as much as it permitted you to really become untethered and to begin to experience the fullness of this place and, again, understand yourself and the world a little bit better. Ben, I'm very grateful for your having spent the time with us today. Good luck on your upcoming uh, exams and papers and in your final semester. And I look forward to seeing not only what you're going to do while you're here, but I'm quite confident I'm looking forward to seeing what you're going to do when you graduate. So thank you. Thanks. Happy to do it. Let me conclude with a slice of life from Gettysburg College. One of the many enjoyable aspects of my job is that it introduces me to remarkable people. A little earlier in the semester, I had the privilege, and it truly was a privilege, to meet Sneha Sharesta. Sneha is a 2010 graduate of the college. She came to Gettysburg from Nepal, wanting to have a more expansive education than was possible at home. She was seeking a true liberal arts experience and began her time here as a globalization studies major. As she described it to me, she enjoyed her studies, but also found herself drawn to a passion for the arts. She ultimately double majored in globalization studies and studio art. Since her graduation, she has become a widely recognized artist who fuses interest and cultures. Her art, typically in the form of large murals, combines the style of American graffiti and Sanskrit scriptures. Her work has been commissioned by Harvard, Reebok, TripAdvisor, and Red Bull, among others. Her murals are found both domestically and throughout the world. Her work is vibrant, provocative, and in some cases even painted in orange and blue. To add to her impressive list of accomplishments, she received her master's degree in education from Harvard University and started the first children's museum in her native Nepal to provide youth a creative space to develop their skills. Gettysburg prides itself on graduating students infused with a healthy dose of practical idealism. Sneha embodies that orientation toward life. She works under the name of Imagine, the translation of her mother's name into English, but to me, she is pure inspiration. Thanks for listening. If you've enjoyed this conversation and want to be notified of future episodes, please subscribe to Conversations Beneath the Cupola by visiting gettysburg.edu. If you have a topic or suggestion for a future podcast, please email news at gettysburg.edu. Thank you. Until next time.